take us there to the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hero Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Next year, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there in the land of Zion. Next year in Jerusalem. Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry of Dr. Daniel Woodhead. Dr. Woodhead has been teaching the Bible for 25 years. He is a pastor, author, and conference speaker on various biblical subjects. Dr. Woodhead is the dean of the Jewish Study School at Schofield Seminary. His seminary teaching includes the Old Testament and Biblical Hebrew. He has attended Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and Hebrew College in Massachusetts. He is well qualified to bring you these Bible messages. This program is dedicated to bringing you relevant insight into the biblical text that pertains to our time. Here is Dr. Woodhead with today's Bible teaching. Welcome to Theology in Perspective, the Bible teaching ministry for Western Michigan. And as you've, uh, if you've been with us for the last six weeks, you know that we've been going through the really interesting prophecy in the Old Testament book of Ezekiel the prophet, who was carted away to Babylon in 597 BC by King Nebuchadnezzar. And there, between 597 BC and 586 BC, he prophesied to Israel to repent so that they would not have to go through what he was going through, and they didn't listen. So in 586 BC, as Ezekiel was prophesying, Nebuchadnezzar came back and he sacked Jerusalem, nearly destroyed the temple, and carted them away to Babylon. Ezekiel received prophecies 2,500 years ago about issues that are prevalent today and even yet future to us. Now, you know we've been going through this prophecy for a couple of months, and we've looked at a variety of aspects of it. And I have with me today uh, a couple of theologians that have been instrumental in my understanding of these scriptures. Uh, Dr. Gary Fisher of Lion of Judah Ministries, and one of my seminary professors, Dr. Thomas McCall. And uh, I'd like to welcome you gentlemen here today, and thank you for coming on the show and helping us develop an even deeper insight into some of these issues. Now, the Good burning... Dr. Woodhead. Well, thank you. <laughs> the, the burning issue, no pun intended, is these weapons. We've looked at these weapons, and many people look at this and say, well, this prophecy must have happened many, many years ago. These people are using bows and arrows and chariots. And, uh, you know, I, uh, I talked through this a few weeks ago and looked at the Hebrew names for these things, and they are actually generic names for weaponry that is used today. For example, the Hebrew word chet is, uh, is just a missile. It's a missile, and uh, of course, uh, Ezekiel wrote down arrows because that's what was prevalent at that time. But it could be a missile today. Uh, Merkiva are the, uh, is a Hebrew word for chariot, and uh, that's what the Israelis call their tanks today, the Merkivas. <laughs> uh -huh. So yeah. um, um, could you folks uh, just help enlighten us about these weapons? Because I think your insight would really be appreciated by the audience. Well, well, one uh, of the strongest arguments for uh, uh, ancient weapons uh, has has to do with uh, the horses, uh, and, uh, not just arrows and bucklers and uh, shields and so forth and so on, which might have a modern counterpart, uh, but it, it, 
goes into great detail in Ezekiel 38 and 39 about the horses, uh, masses of horses uh, being uh, uh, ridden down into uh, Israel, uh, the mountains of Israel and the plains of Israel uh, from the invading armies. And not only that, but uh, it describes at the end of the battle, when uh, they are destroyed, that the birds and the beasts uh, will have a great feast on the horses as well as the uh, humans, the soldiers and so forth and so on. And if the uh, Merkava or tanks, uh, I, I don't think the I, I think the birds and the and the uh, you know the vultures and the, and the uh, beasts would have indigestion trying to uh, eat them. So that, that that is a an argument for more primitive warfare, uh, and that needs to be taken into consideration. Well, I, that, that's an interesting uh, concept. I know that uh, modern-day um, armed divisions of military is, uh, are called the cavalry. And um, it's not uncommon for uh, military, even today, to use horses in these mountainous regions in the Middle East. So um, the probability of genuine horses is very strong. I, I agree with you. I, I think they, they could actually be there. And uh, I think that uh, that lends credence to the uh, idea of this prophecy being still future to us. Uh, um, Danny, I'd like to have input here, if I may. Uh, thank you for having me on the program. It's a great honor uh, to be with you and Tom. Uh, Tom, you brought up the horses and the uh, feast that uh, the birds are going to have on the soldiers and so forth. When Ezekiel wrote this 2,500 years ago, between now and the time he wrote this, Israel had exited the land. 70 AD, the Romans destroyed uh, most of the infrastructure of Israel and dispersed the Jewish people all over the world. And all of the... Uh, would you say the agriculture of Israel just died and the land became uh, just a, a malaria infested swamp? They had five swamps and most of it became desert. And so the point I'm getting to is these birds are mentioned in Israel are going to feast on these soldiers and horses and, and that kind of thing for 2000 years. Almost 2,000 years, those birds have not been present in Israel. Why? Because there was nothing there for them to feed on. The place became a, a desert. And uh, so the birds have been migrating over Israel for many thou a couple thousand years, but there was no reason for them to stay in Israel. There was nothing to eat. So they would just fly over and go to Asia or Europe uh, and use Israel as a flyway. Today, that situation has changed completely. Israel has become an agricultural wonder. Uh, there's all kinds of fish ponds and wild animals and so forth and so on. And so what we're seeing today are thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, birds of prey that migrate out of Africa that are on their way to Asia and Europe. They stop off in Israel. Uh, and we've got a little character named a griffin vulture that is now taken up residence in Israel. And uh, that little guy uh, can eat about 160 pounds of food every two days. He has an eight-foot wingspan. His body is four feet long. And there's several hundred of those that have taken up residence in Israel. There's several thousand of them in the world. And today, Israel is in the position where it can host those birds, and I think it's relevant that now we're talking about these prophecies being fulfilled and the birds are starting to rally in place for this upcoming battle. Gary, that's one of the four main requirements for this battle to be uh, in the near future. One is that Israel is a state again because this prophecy clearly says that Israel is a state and you just touched on one of the biggest ones is that the, the waste places are now inhabited and uh, it's not a wasteland anymore. The agricultural development and so on that you just cited is phenomenal. 
The other Amen. one, the other one is that Israel is living in unwalled uh, uh, villages. Uh, consider that. Uh, uh, Mark Twain made a uh, trip to the land of Israel. Uh, it was then called Palestine and uh, wrote his uh, book, Innocence Abroad. And anyway, when he visited the, the Holy Land, uh, he was very disappointed because it was uh, it was a wasteland then, right? And uh, it 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 was desolate, and uh, it, and very few Jews lived there, uh, and and very few people lived there as far as that goes. So, but now that Israel's back in the land, it has been revitalized tremendously. And uh, there's seven million Jews. Uh, in fact, I heard the eight million Jews there uh, uh, now, uh, and it is a, a vibrant nation uh, with magnificent cities. And uh, as Gary uh, said, uh, it, it, the, the the fauna and flora have uh, are abundant there, and they are not only feeding themselves, but they're exporting food and technology and all other things uh, and drip irrigation uh, wonderful things are happening in Israel uh, that look like what uh, the situation uh, that Israel is in when Ezekiel 38 and 39 are fulfilled well that, that is this? really interesting you know and it, it, it lends to the other two fundamental requirements that this prophecy gives and that is one israel is in unwalled villages mm. and you know you go to jerusalem today or any of the other cities and the only thing that's walled right now is the old city of jerusalem and that's just uh, quaint you know it's beautiful and uh, everybody loves to go there but the rest of jerusalem doesn't have walls around it and right. the reason that is is because the last requirement is that israel is dwelling securely Mm. And uh, we all know that that's so controversial because that concept there, um, dwelling securely, has been argued for so long. And that dwelling securely is what causes people to place the actual invasion at some time other than the near future to us. Now, Gary, what does uh, walled uh, or um, Israel dwelling securely mean to you? Well, uh, in verse 8 is where we first see the word securely mentioned about Israel, describing their condition. Verse 11, the word again. And uh, verse 14, the word again. Uh, securely all three times. And that word is betok. Betok. And its alternative reading can be uh, uh, confident. Yep, so exactly. if we interpret it as living confidently in the land, that would describe Israel of today. The Israeli Defense Force is one of the high, most highly trained uh, defense forces in the entire world. They are rated on uh, several military websites as probably the number one rated infantry in the world. Their Air Force is rated number three in the world behind the United States and uh, China, I believe. I uh, could be wrong about that, but I believe they are rated third or fourth. Uh, either one of those uh, makes a good point. The little country, 70 miles wide and 280 miles long, has the third rated air force in the world. Uh, and they have several times proven that they can fight wars on several fronts and kick the backsides of their enemies, and they are an incredible fighting force. And the people of Israel today are living confidently in that ability to fight off whatever comes their way. Amen. Just to add to that, uh, I've just recently heard uh, uh, about the stock market in Israel. Amen. Uh, the uh, stock market in Israel. Did you know that there was a stock market in Israel? Yes. And it is up 10% in 2014. Wow. So that, what, that's a measure of confidence and uh, security. Absolutely. And whether the rest of the world thinks so or not, Israel is, is, is in good shape. 
Oh my goodness, well, yes. You know, um, Israel to, to, is dwelling securely, as secure as any other country that is a westernized democracy that has an anchor in the land. I mean, the land was given to them. Let's not even talk about God giving it to the Abraham, but uh, the UN gave it to them in the fall of 1947. And they have this land. They are there securely. I have a quick personal anecdote to relate about that. I uh, am still taking modern Hebrew lessons from uh, an, a teacher up in Netanya. And uh, last year I said to her, well, aren't you concerned about these wars going on in Syria and all these activities? I said, aren't you concerned about the rockets? And she just sloughed it off as a non-event. Ah, oh, happens all the time. I mean, That's right. she just wasn't concerned at all. <laughs> well, there's, uh, Danny, there's two major ways to look at this. Uh, uh, you already mentioned one where there are some that like to think about this word securely, meaning that Israel is living with no threat. And I, my position there is that there is never a time until the millennium when Israel will live with no threat uh, from an invading army. Uh, there is a qualifier there. Uh, when they're living confidently in the land describes today and the Israel that we see today. However, uh, there is a coming time when they will live with a, under a pseudo peace, a false peace, when the Antichrist uh, of Daniel 9.27 signs a peace agreement and there will be three and a half years of a false peace in which it looks like Israel is living securely. Uh, is it likely that the battle will take place then? Uh, I would say no. It looks like more to the point that the battle could occur at any day with Israel living uh, confidently in the land right now. Absolutely. I, I fully agree. I think Tom agrees too. This this uh, this dwelling just, securely. To underscore that. Remember, uh, just this recent war with Hamas in Gaza. Uh, they were pouring thousands of rockets uh, aimed at Israel, and what happened? There was the Iron Dome. Uh, <laughs> the, the Patriot missiles uh, and all were uh, uh, disabling those rockets that they fell to the ground. The, the people that I'm in contact with over there, when I talk to them about those things, they view it as an irritant and nothing more than that. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, you know, there's a shopping center, a very nice shopping center called Mamila. It's right next to the old city. And uh, Joan and I were going there quite frequently last year when I was at the university. And uh, recently, the uh, IDF and the local police department and the Mossad and other groups got together and they thwarted a suicide bomber before he even got a chance to think about doing this. They knew that this guy had access to these things and they stopped yeah. him before he even was able to assemble anything. Um, they have a very, very God-given prowess to secure their future there and and nothing's going to take it away and let me just say one more thing is uh what other country has perfect peace there, there's no such thing and we're Absolutely. secure over here we know that there are robberies and diseases and we got terrorism here and there but we're secure so, that's right. yeah that's, the, the, that right. word secure is not to be translated as without a threat absolutely uh, absolutely yeah. Well, Tom, you, know, you were going to say something. Uh, just that uh, they, they really do feel very secure there, uh, uh, and with reason. And, of course, there, there is a biblical promise that no weapon that is formed against you will, will prosper. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, if you'll let me get in here, I'd like to comment on that. It was a little post that I put in my next newsletter. And uh, it is a testimonial that was recorded on IsraelToday.com. Uh, of a, one of the guys that was operating the Iron Dome. And uh, they, he was tracking a rocket that was coming out of uh, Gaza uh, during this recent Gaza war. And the Iron Dome missile that he was going to shoot this rocket down with wouldn't fire. 
And so he is sitting there like got four seconds to react. And two seconds later, when the, when his fail safe did not work, he thought the missile was going to hit Tel Aviv. And he sat and personally watched and gave his personal testimony that he watched this missile turn in midair and went out to the Mediterranean all of its own and exploded out over the Mediterranean. Now, what was it? No weapon formed what? <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I saw a news clip about six months ago of a, a Hamas guy complaining that the Israelis God is causing their own missiles to turn back and fire on Hamas. He says, it's just not too. fair. It's just not fair. I saw that too. <laughs> uh, it's precious. Uh, it, gentlemen, there's a, the, the, the reason that I have brought those concepts into this discussion is because I want to talk about when this invasion is going to happen. There is uh, no historical precedent to say that it has ever happened before. I mean, the circumstances outlined in the prophecy are only prevalent today. And if you look at Russia, for example, that is the primary progenitor of this with this man whose title is Gog, G-O-G, he um he wants to come south to get some sort of booty some uh some uh, gold silver who knows what he wants to come and get and israel as you said before recently was a wasteland before 1948 or so it was a wasteland there's nothing here right some have speculated well maybe it's the uh chromium and the other chemicals in the dead sea maybe he'd want that or or maybe Maybe he wants to just get into the Middle East so he can turn on his neighbors, the Muslims, that are supposedly his quasi-friends, and um, once he does that, he'll get their oil. But um, I understand, and Tom, I would ask that you uh, help us with this, because I know you know a lot about it, that there's been some uh, natural resource finds there in the recent uh, last year and a half or so that are just enormous. Uh Ben Gurion made a, uh, a famous joke uh, back when he was prime minister uh, that Moses led the people of Israel around in the wilderness for 40 years until he finally brought them into the land in the Middle East that didn't have any oil. <laughs> well, you can't say that now. Uh, that was true before. They hadn't found any. But now there are tremendous resources of oil and gas that have been discovered. The offshore uh, uh, finds that they've made are phenomenal. And now they have found uh, that there is uh, an enormous reservoir of oil underneath the land of Israel that can be reached by the new technology of fracking. Right. And they're uh, studying that very closely, and they are con very seriously considering uh, uh, using that technology uh, to get oil. So it's, it's become one of the oil meccas of the world. You know, what's uh, interesting is that uh, today, well, Russia has been historically a persecutor of the Jews, uh, from the shtetls to the... Um, you know, the, the czars persecuted them, and uh, oh my goodness, the things that they did to them. Um, the uh, Germans uh, that are mentioned in Germania in this prophecy, you know, we know what they've done in the Holocaust. And the Muslim nations have had a war against them for a long time. Recently, the Russians have invaded the Ukraine in the eastern part of the Ukraine. They have come into the Crimea. They're growing closer to Israel. They've threatened Israel and they've aligned themselves with the Muslim nations. The Muslim nations have done more than threaten Israel. With this recent group called ISIS, they have uh, vocally uh, voiced their opposition to Christians and Jews and said they're going to exterminate us all. And uh, the Jew first and uh, then we're going after the Christians. So the people of the book they want to take out. These threats have become so prominent recently that this prophecy is becoming more real 
even for the people that haven't looked at this in the detail that you gentlemen have, uh, it's, it's, it's becoming very, very obvious. Now, I just wanted to mention a few things here that the Bible doesn't give us exact dates of things. There's a long chronology of, from the creation of the world all the way through to the eternal order. And it gives us a relative position of these prophecies. Now, what has been discussed about this prophecy has always been in relationship to the Great Tribulation, the seven-year Great Tribulation. Some have said, well, it's going to happen after the Great Tribulation. It's going to happen in the Millennial Kingdom. And others have said, no, 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 that 75-day interval before the Millennial Kingdom starts and after the Tribulation, that's where it's going to happen. And I would say probably, I, you know, correct me if I'm wrong here, that most would say, well, no, this is the Battle of Armageddon. This is the Battle of Armageddon. It's the last battle, mm -hmm. uh, last stage of the last battle in the Great Tribulation. Some say it happens in the middle of the Tribulation, mid-trib. But the data seems to me to point to it happening before the Tribulation. Uh, in the last show, for the viewers, if you could remember, I talked about the weaponry and the weapon, the residue of the weapons burning for seven years yeah. by the heat. Um, and there is a, a seven-month period, either before anybody can go in to start cleaning up this residue, or there are seven months of cleaning. I'm, you know, you can read it either way. It, but, but the seven months and the seven years produce data that forces this prophecy to get a little clearer as to when it's going to happen. Mm. Um, and I see this happening before the Great Tribulation, which is sometime yet future to us, but before this Antichrist world leader is going to sign his covenant with the nation Israel. Now, um, how, how do you gentlemen uh, see this positioning? I think you uh, uh, wholeheartedly, uh, Dan, the, the uh, seven year period is, is significant. And it happens to be the same length of time as what Daniel, Ezekiel's uh, contemporary, uh, came up with in the, uh, in the 70th week of Daniel. Uh, that's seven years also. Is that just a coincidence? I think not. I think there is, uh, there is, they are coterminous. They are the same uh, period of time, which, which means that uh, the Gog and Magog attack would be uh, uh, before the tribulation uh, begins. Perhaps it is the impetus for the Antichrist to come on the stage uh, and make his uh, uh, treaty and confirm his treaty with the nation Israel. Now that's an excellent point because once this happens, what is going to happen is, according to the text here, the invaders lose their political prowess on the world scene. They're done. Mm. They, they, they don't have any more power. And uh, that leaves only the Western democracies to coalesce and um, somehow out of that set of countries that have sort of like-minded economic and, and freedom uh, ideas, there's going to be a 10-nation confederacy. You know, the Bible doesn't tell us whether it's geographic or whether it's economic or some combination of the two, but it's out of that 10 that the Antichrist comes. So this could w very well be... Uh, as you pointed out, Tom, the catalyst that causes this um, one world leader to come into power. There is a, a really a strong uh, implication in Ezekiel 39.11 that justifies Tom's point. Uh, we are introduced in Ezekiel 36 at the end of the chapter. While all the trouble is going on around Israel, it says the passers-by continue to come through uh, Israel. And I believe that's a reference to the three and a half million tourists that continue to come irregardless of what happens and that kind of stuff. Well, the passers-by are mentioned again in Ezekiel 39.11. And it says... 
when the the uh, Gog is destroyed, he will be uh, given a burial ground, and the burial ground will block the activity of the passers-by. So here, here we've got the if they're tourists here we got them they're not going to be tourists in the middle of the tribulation or at the exactly, exactly. <laughs> at the end of the tribulation when do we have tourists in israel today oh, right now yep and Good, uh, you your, know, your groups uh, Gary. oh yeah absolutely uh, <laughs> yeah you know there's another aspect of that that i think we need to bring out and that's what the text says that those people uh, will not be able to touch any of the bones of the people who have been uh, conquered, um, and they have men that, you know, my old King James is pretty quaint, it calls sever out men of continual employment. I mean, they got professionals. Uh, uh, wait a minute, you just tell us where the bone is and we'll go get it. We don't want you touching these things, which lends credence to the idea that this is probably uh, nuclear weaponry, which would burn, you know, for a long time. Well, gentlemen, I think it's been a pleasure having you. I think we've our time is out, and uh, I need to uh, say uh, lahitraot. Uh, lahitraot. And blessings lahitraot. to you both. Lila Tov. To the land of Zion, next year in Jerusalem, the Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim. Next year in Jerusalem, O hear, O Israel, O Israel, hear. O Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done next year. The Shana Haba'a, the Yerushalayim, next year in Jerusalem. Over there, over there in the land of Zion, next year in Jerusalem.